Hello, my name is John. Thank you for joining my channel. This is all about electrical. And I'd like to discuss what's happened in the last 50 years from personal experience and how the electrical field has changed and some of the different uh, problems that we have now that we didn't have before. The biggest difference in the electrical field is taking place due to PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers, and DHS systems, which basically allow remote I.O., analog, digital. And the, what it means is, is that there's a lot of parts that can be put into a little black box and do timing, on-off, logic of different types, uh, truth tables, etc. But that didn't start really happening until the 70s. I was working in the automobile industry back at that time for Ford Motor Company, and they were just starting to bring in the uh, PLCs and DHS systems and taking out a lot of the panels that had the blocks and things in them. And that was a big point as far as changing <clears throat> the whole way electrical systems were laid out and designed. Prior to that, I'd started doing electrical when I was 13, I, it was 1968, I built a five tube radio and also built a motor when they still had classrooms that had trade schools and occupational training and that sort of thing within the, the school district. And that was a lot of fun. That was a good beginning. My mother was a general contractor, my grandfather and my father and my great great grandfather they were all contractors of some kind or another. So we come from a long line of contractors and self-employed people. So to me, it was always easier to go out and get a job than to try to apply for a job. But there were times that I did apply for jobs and did work for someone else. Back in the 60s, my dad made most of his money through a security alarm company and the reason for that is he had a lot of reoccurring revenue. You'd get these customers and they would have you maintain their systems and they would also pay for monitoring of different types. And at that time, it was pretty primitive. We were using tape dialing machines. Also, we built tape dialing machines out of four track tape decks and did our own little timing system. And we used garage door electronics, the switches for controlling the garage door opening and closing. So they were pretty primitive, but the guy that we worked for, we officially called him Tomcat. His name was uh, Tomcat. So we would give uh, him the dialers and we would install them and he would sell them for some exorbitant price. And apparently he was making most of the money because we were making a lot of money, but we were making some money doing that. We also did security alarm systems where we'd put in what would be considered primitive today. We used to make our own under carpet mats where you put it under the carpet and if somebody stepped on it, we would use tar paper, chicken wire, just kind of staple it together and call it good. and. But that stuff really worked. It lasts for a long time. We also did uh, different types of uh, like traps and that sort of thing where you'd have a trip wire where, where if you pulled it. Also, this one guy was so crazy about having his house alarmed. He had the wind, the screens, had a switch on them in case somebody took the screen off. He had the windows bugged so if someone opened the window. And he also went so far as the sewing magnets and the curtains, so that the curtains moved, they would set off the alarm. So this guy had like a triple barrier between him and whoever was trying to get into his house. So we did some pretty elaborate stuff, met a lot of interesting people. We did a few security systems for uh, movie stars, well-known singers, we did a lot of work in Hollywood, Bel Air, Beverly Hills, clear out to Malibu, 
out to the valley, San Fernando Valley, Agora Hills, and all that sort of area. <clears throat> so we got around a lot, and we had a lot of interesting things happen with that. Then I went into my own company, which was a electrical contracting company. And since my mom was a general contractor, we did a lot of remodels and new construction. But even growing up, I started working in construction when I was 10 years old. And a lot of times I had kids to go home and take care of them also after I worked and went to school. But our fun was going and doing tear out on a house. My mom would let us tear out all the cabinets, tear out the drywall, tear out the bathroom, tear out the kitchen. Oh, it was great fun, and we had a lot of good times doing it. We didn't know that we were supposed to get paid for that, but we did it anyway. So that helped the family in a lot of different ways. After that, in the 80s, early 80s, I went to work for uh, a railroad company and worked there five years, which was very interesting because we stripped the locomotives and we would take them but brand new wire and <clears throat> uh, rewire the motors and do a lot of different rehab to them. We could completely recondition, rewire a locomotive for approximately $750,000, which is quite a savings compared to a new one being $3 million. But there was miles and miles of wire in these locomotives. I spent several years rewiring the motors in the motor shop and putting in frame field kits and a lot of that different stuff that just in the whole building for the motor rebuilding. Spent a lot of time doing that. I also did work on the wiring harnesses, stripped out some of them, did a lot of work with the traction motors, completed. Even some of the old ones coming in, they would pay us eight hours overtime for five hours work, and all we had to do was pop off five pinions. And these are the gears that would go on the shaft of the motor. And if you knew what you were doing, you could probably do one in less than five minutes. But certain people had great difficulty getting any of these pinions off, so they kind of set the standard for one hour per pinion. So I was good with that. I just did what I was told, and uh, I thought that was fair enough. I'd already worked eight hour shift before I took the overtime, so I probably needed a uh, half time shift anyway. And that went on for about five years. After that, I opened up my own security alarm company. And in the early 90s, late 80s, there was a lot of recession and that going on. And I'd go around and pitch these alarms and say, boy, do I have a deal for you? And they'd say, well, I hope so, because the last five guys that are in here were given away for free. So I thought, Wow, that's kind of hard to beat, but when you consider the fact that we were getting a three-year contract, most of those contracts would sell for 20 times face value, and they were probably 20 bucks a month, so it'd be, that'd be a $400 job for probably about $100 worth of material and maybe a few hours work, so even giving them away for free, that worked out to be pretty good money. From then, I went to work for a water district, which I spent 25 years at, and I thought, oh, I was a fairly decent electrician. I'd been a, had my contractor license for 10 years. I'd done some commercial, some residential, but when I hired on there, I was actually just doing low voltage communication with this old telemetry type of equipment that was archaic by today's standards. Each set of cards might cost $1,500, and it was two sets of cards, one at the office and one out in the field, and they would talk to each other. 
Well, nowadays that would seem very, very primitive because they have whole PLC systems that might have a dozen or more analog inputs, digital inputs, outputs, and all types of uh, software to monitor it with. We really didn't have any of that as far as a backup. And that was uh, quite challenging as far as keeping the phone lines. You always had people pointing fingers back and forth at each other, saying it's not our problem, it's that guy's problem, or this phone system goes from this city to another city to back to where you're at. And we were spending a lot of money on phone lines. But nevertheless, we had to deal with all this frustration until we decided to go with radio telemetry. And telemetering is long distance metering through uh, a couple of radios. You'd have a broadcast, you'd have a radio that was bi-directional that would send and receive information. So we had taken send and receive information and run it through multiplexer and then demultiplex it at the other end and extract our data and have all kinds of information or real-time situations as far as anything out in the field. We could tell the pump levels, the well levels, the whether something was on or off. We had all this information and also things should be controlled remotely. They would send a start or a stop or that type of thing depending on whether it was we were on a time of use schedule and we had to make sure it went off. So even though we had built-in timers, we could either do it automatically or remotely by hand. Actually, I'm there to cite it by hand. And it was a pretty good system for that time. Then we, this was all run on a computer basically with a bunch of ones and zeros and code written out and really no illustrations like uh, you'd have with Windows or that sort of thing. Windows really didn't come of age until 1985. And by that time I'd been working with computers for a while and you, it just kind of came in slowly. I did attend school while I worked and in 1985 I was a computer, I was going to school as a computer programmer or maintenance type of person and we were still learning basic. Some people even carried their programs around in uh, these little boxes with a bunch of cards on them for some of the older systems. They were still around at the time. So from, <clears throat> from there, there was a lot of Things had changed, obviously. The, the screens back then, you had a choice of three colors, either green, white, or orange. And as I mentioned, there was virtually no graphics on them whatsoever. So as that evolved, we did get better software as the years went by, and it did become more and more sophisticated. But on the other hand, it became more complicated because we had to build all these graphics that interface with the computer screen and then they could show you the levels. And I'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing. It was interesting to see the development rather than just walk over to a computer and type in whatever the level was. It was certainly more visual. And when I first went to work for this company, most of that was done on chart recorders. They had these little motors that ran about one eight RPA, so it's one eighth of a revolution per hour. So the tape was running pretty slow on this graph paper and the needle had a little felt marker on it and go back and forth and it would monitor the different levels of the different things that we were gathering information from. When I, in 1987, I was doing a newspaper just to illustrate how things have changed because that was only about 30 years ago or so. 
just to get a typeset machine. It was $30,000. It did six different fonts, I think a few different sizes, and it would actually project it on the photographic paper and take a picture of the letter. So you'd have a white background with a black letter was your only choice, really, because it was basically a photograph. And then you'd take that off and you'd put wax on it, and wax on the other paper and stick it together with a wax seal just between the two. And it worked out okay, but a lot of times your stuff would fall off like the day of the week or some other vital piece of information that was stuck on there and not stuck on there very well. So, you know, it basically come off. Now, as far as the electrical migration, things got better and better. The equipment always got cheaper and better. We got for the same price as what we were paying for these monochromatic one color screens and uh, a computer that might have 20 meg of information on it. We we're getting it with gigabytes, terabytes and all the rest of it. The speed was phenomenal. In fact, the earliest machine that we had was, we had the old floppy disk. In fact, my computer only had one disk drive and no hard drive, so. But the one at the district had a 10 inch floppy. That's 10 inches in diameter, both ways. It was like a square. And then it held five K of, in, of information. That's probably not even a paragraph with these new word processing machines because they have so much code embedded in them. But back then you could get more because the code was much simpler and you just simply put it in. It's amazing to me how some things have progressed, but the same concept is basically the same. Morris code has short and long uh, durations or keystrokes to it. And computers, if you strip it down to its basic level, is trillions of zeros and ones. But nevertheless, they're all switches when it comes down to it. And there's either, there, it's either a zero or a one. And on this, this base two numbering system, you build it up from there. You get four numbers, it's a, a, a byte, and then it's a word, and so on. And you get into your ASCII characters, which is, there's 256 of those. That's just one, two times two times two times two you come up to 256 and that amount of ones and zeros breaks down to a number that's at least 256. So that's basically how they built out the system but nevertheless it always goes down to the most basic concept and that's it's either ones or zeros in your binary system and that's true with any computer even today. I like breaking things down to their simplest level and I've always found that to be very useful. Now, as far as other types of electrical, the different drive systems on motors, because basically on motors it's always the amount of speed you can get out of them, controllability, torque, and different factors like that. So. What happened was we had a lot of this sophisticated high dollar, high heavy duty stuff that would be like starters or auto transformers or different things like that that would cost really big bucks. And that was all replaced by different types of drives, frequency drives or freak drives they're called. And they were quite large and quite expensive when they first started coming out, but as the years went by, they got much smaller, much more sophisticated. They had a lot more programmability to them. They had a lot of different factors that they would consider. 
they had better protection because you could put under torque, over torque, a lot of different alarms or set points to where it would either turn off the motor or you'd have to come out and manually reset it to make sure that you had actually checked the motor to make sure that there was a problem that was pretty benign or if it went out on something more graphic then uh, it would force you to take care of the problem without ignoring the alarm. But protection is only as good as what it is and if you have somebody that doesn't care and they go out and eliminate the protect protection and just turn it back on and say hey it looks good for my house then <laughs> That sort of thing can lead to big problems because eventually it's going to really have a catastrophic effect on it. From, uh, from all the different things that have changed, I've noticed that a lot of the changes that have occurred in the human factor as far as the ability of older workers versus younger workers or conscientiousness or the level of education. I'm working at an institution now that trains electricians. I'm an electrical instructor. And some of the pushback that I've gotten were from other instructors. And to me, it was just pure ignorance because some of these instructors had never actually been out in the real world. And what I want to do is try to bring in real world circumstances and challenge them with the fact that in the real world, you may rough in a building and come back in four months and finish it. And these boxes, these wires, these devices might be 40 feet away from each other or further or around the corner or up on the ceiling or any which number of places. And they weren't even having to mark their wires, if you can believe that. I taught them that as far as anything that's going to be in my box, that there's only four types of wires. There are travelers, there's hot wires, there's switched hots, and there's neutrals. Those are the only four types of wires in the box. And so the principle is that if a, a pair of wires are travelers, that's their whole purpose in life is to travel. They don't switch anything. They don't do anything. All they do is travel from one switch to the other. And so their very specific purpose wiring. So those would be twisted together so you knew that those two travelers were inseparable. Now, if you have a three-way switch, you have to have a pair of three-way switches. You're not going to find one three-way switch. So if you have a pair of three-way switches, you're going to find that one side of the switch circuit is switched and the other side has a hot to it. So the way I would mark my wires is I would twist the travelers together, I'd bend them over 180 degrees so they're just folded back on top of themselves then I'd take the other wire whether it's the switch wire or the hot wire and wrap it around the travelers and place them in the correct position as far as in a multi-gang box if it's a four-gang box and the, the three-way is in the second position let's say it's for the hall or the the hall light or something of that nature, then wherever it's designated on the plan, that's where it was in the box. So it's pretty simple for someone to come back and finish that project. If it was a four-way switch, you'd have a set of travelers with two more travelers wrapped around that. And anybody that knows anything about a four-way switch the travelers would come in the top and go out the bottom two. The bottom screws are marked with a black or a dark coating on them. 
and they're different than the ones on the top of the switch. It doesn't matter which side the travelers enter the switch or leave the switch. All that's important is that that's, they do come in the top and go out the bottom. You can't have the travelers hook up to the side of the switch and expect it to work. Not one set of travelers is not going to be on one side of the switch and one on the other. That is not going to work. So, if someone opened a box and saw the two travelers, they would immediately know that's a four-way switch. Then the last scenario is, is if you have just a switch wire, it could be going to a half-hop plug, a light, a fan, anything that's switched, and you take that wire that has like a little curly cue in it, like a little pig's tail, and wrap it around the the hot wire, and now you have a switch. You have a hot and a switch lay. Then all your white wires, they all go together because all the neutrals would tie together. The only exception to that that I've found, and this is sort of brought to my attention because they're working on multiple boxes in a small area, it's more likely to happen. If you have a GFCI, a ground fault circuit interrupter type of a receptacle, there's the line side of the receptacle and the load side of the receptacle. Now on the line side goes the line, and then the, on the load side is everything beyond that switch is protected. So instead of spending 10 bucks for a GFI receptacle, you can put a, up to 10 downstream from there that may be on your back porch, they might be in your kitchen, they might be in your garage, they could be anywhere. And once that trips, then you're left to wonder where it came from. As far as that, the original head of the line GFI could be up in the bathroom and you might have a problem with your receptacle on the back porch not working. And you can go check the breakers and they're fine, but it's interrupted because of the ground fault interrupter. And if you didn't have any use to light in your bathroom for a while, you wouldn't even notice that there was another receptacle that wasn't working. So the way to avoid that is to not be cheap and just to buy enough ground fault protection to where you can put each receptacle on everywhere that they go and that eliminates the problem because if it trips in the bathroom you know that the receptacle is only in the bathroom it doesn't go any further than that because the con the conductors for the hots or the neutral are all wired together and only a small pigtail is coming off that to go to the load side of your GFI and there's nothing down below that. Well, on some of these students would install a GFI and come off the bottom of it and then they would realize that they need a neutral or something at some point and drag a neutral for somewhere other than the downside of the GFCI plug and that caused a problem because it would be imbalanced. The principle of the GFI plug is, is that the same amount of current that leaves the plug has to return to the plug, and if there's a deficiency or if it detects that some electron, some uh, part of the uh, current flow that had gone out didn't return, it immediately says that there's some ground and it's taking another path and to shut it down, which in theory, that's a good thing. But just on a practical note, if you put a zip cord or an extension cord or something directly across the GFI and held it in both hands, it wouldn't know whether your heart was a toaster or a light bulb. It's not going to trip because you're not going to ground. The same amount of current that's coming in your left arm is leaving your right arm and therefore it's not going to sense a problem. 
But even with that shortcoming, they have saved a lot of lives and I think they're important. Because one thing's for certain, the only way you are going to eliminate people being electrocuted and problems like that is if they actually interrupt the power when there's a problem. And GFCI breakers or receptacles at this point are the best thing we have as far as that goes. Another area of a electrical circuit that seems to be badly understood is the whole idea of grounding and bonding a circuit. For some reason, people think that a ground rod or grounding something is going to give them some type of protection. The facts are, you could take a wire directly off of your main breaker, take it and hook it directly to your ground rod, and you will not trip the breaker. You might have 20 plus amps going through that conductor down to your ground rod and then just going through your ground rod, probably back up the neutral to your pole, but it doesn't really care. As far as it knows, the resistance in the earth, which is probably around five ohms or so, is a load. And it has no way of knowing the difference. So in that case, the only thing that would have helped, if anything, is if you had a situation where it's going through a ground fault type breaker. So even if you walked up and touched the ground wire, which is hot, and you were grounded somehow, then it would say that the same amount of current is not following the same path and has taken another path, so therefore it would trip the breaker. That's what it's designed to do. There have been thousands and thousands of ground rods driven all over the country. In most cities, you have a ground rod at every lamp post and that type of thing thinking that they're offering some kind of protection to people or property or something else. And that's simply not true. You could have a pole that's 50 feet high, solid steel that comes down to three foot long anchors and concrete and all the rest of it. And then they put this tiny little ground wire on there coming off the bed, base, usually welded on there somehow and you could have a hundred thousand volts of light electricity or lightning hit it and just burn up that little wire and never think twice in fact if anything what the ground rod does is it brings the electricity right into the deep earth and it goes and radiates out from there similar to where if you threw a rock or a pebble into a pond and you see the ripples going away from that splash at the very epicenter. The same thing would happen if you had this amount of electricity or current, actually it's a current that's traveling through the ground rod into the earth and, and back again. That would be, what would happen is, is that the lightning would force the electricity further into the earth and radiate to the next lamppost, the next lamppost, to anything else, street signs, all that would become electrified because you created a stronger path into the earth rather than it just go maybe on the surface. So you can create a lot of your own problems. There's a big debate well, it's not really a debate, but there's a problem where these people are spending millions of dollars on these CNC, these uh, computerized milling machines and that sort of thing, that the equipment manufacturer insists and writes in there on, in writing that you must not ground this. Well, the problem is, is the inspector comes out and says, you're not going to get a final inspection unless you ground this piece of equipment. 
then even if you disconnect the ground, excuse me, then even if you <clears throat> put in the ground and something happens, that's on you also, I, I guess. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't be going after my insurance company. Or the other possibility is, is they give you the final and then you go disconnect the ground. Now you're kind of off into uncharted territory. Do I or do I not follow the National Electric Code and knowingly do something that I know to be wrong, or at least not wrong, possibly better to say that doesn't agree with the code. So you've set yourself up for another issue as far as if that's a problem. I, I like the old saying, it's never a problem until it's a problem. But once you have a big problem of a piece of equipment that's worth millions of dollars or someone gets hurt, that's when it really starts to become a problem. So there's a lot of that type of thing that really have to take into consideration. And one of my favorite people as far as the electrical field goes is Mike Holt. He and his team sit on some of the boards as far as making decisions, changing things in the code, trying to consolidate different bits of information all in the same area. So there's a lot of cohesiveness there. Because quite often in the code, you have to jump from one place to another to another to hunt down all the exceptions and all of the caveats that they come up with in the code. So that in and of itself can be a big problem. I'm amazed to think that 1897 was their first code book that was published, and that's the year my grandfather was born. So you're not talking about a great big long time ago. You know, you're talking about a what, 110 years type of thing. So that is not a great deal of time compared to millenniums of history. Well, from that point on, it became worse and worse. The electric light bulb was actually patented in 1802 by a man by the name of Hayes, but it never worked and it didn't have a, much of a life expectancy, but it did flicker on there long enough for him to get a patent on the idea. Well, Mr. Edison, about uh, 78 years later, he, had, he patented his, his light bulb on January 27th, 1880. And what he was patenting was a working version of the incandescent light. And the way that he found out that it was going to stay working is he discovered that if you remove the oxygen from the light, the lamp bowl, the, the glass part, and you sealed it after you removed all the air out of it, then once there was no air, then you could turn that white hot and it still wouldn't burn up or incinerate whatsoever. So that was the major breakthrough, was finding out that if there's something that hot, it still can't burn up unless it has oxygen. <clears throat> so that was the breakthrough that after thousands of experiments that uh, Edison came up with. Well, in 1893, there was the World's Fair in Chicago. And it was supposed to be the fair that was going to show the, a glimpse into the future as to whether or not there was going to be electric lights and electric motors and things like that throughout our entire world and cities and things like that. Well, at that time, virtually nobody even had a light bulb in their house, much less motors or anything like that. Vacuum cleaners, washing machines, all that was human power, hand-driven type of equipment. 
But nevertheless, it's sort of like going to Tomorrowland back when Disneyland had the Carousel of Progress, and you could go to Tomorrowland and see how this Jetson-style living was going to be here before you knew it. And actually, I remember in 65, going through that exhibit, and the thing that impressed me the most was at the very end of the, the Carousel of Progress, there was this modern city, and I was talking about one day being able to have your own personal phone, and not only that, to be able to see another person using your phone. To me, that was so space-age, far into the future, that it was unimaginable to me. I didn't think I was going to see that, not in my lifetime. But as it turns out, I very much have seen it and used that technology on a regular basis to face time and things like that. But I was probably in my 30s before I even got a, a, te a telephone, a uh, wireless rem telephone uh, that you could take with you. The cell phone wasn't invented until the year I was in high school, and that was in 1973. And then even after that, it wasn't affordable because it was heavy and bulky and you had to pay a dollar for every minute that you talked on it, whether you were receiving or sending a call. <coughs> so that in and of itself was something that would make it very prohibitive, at least. Well, as technology changed, that became more and more less of a factor. But going back to 1893, the one thing that they were trying to do was get an electric light going and to try to get people to just get a light in their house. Well, Nikolai Tesla went and worked for Thomas Edison, and he was working in his shop under Thomas Edison, and J.P. Morgan was basically backing Edison, and Edison had his own plans, and they didn't include AC current, alternating current, electrical system. Well, when it came time to bid for this job at the World's Fair, Westinghouse, another investor that was backing Tesla, seriously underbid the project and knew that he was going to lose a lot of money initially going into doing this project at the World's Fair. But he, he considered that a small investment because he had already bought the patents from Tesla for the AC transformer, and AC motors and that sort of thing. And he could definitely see the future as far as electricity was going. And the person that was awarded that contract for the World's Fair lighting and all the exhibits was also going to be given the contract for the first power distribution over in uh, the Niagara Falls area uh, in New York. And he knew that this is much bigger than just one event. So he was very much willing to put his money where his thoughts were as far as the future. Well, it definitely paid off for him and AC became the winner just based on the, the transportability, the fact that you can transform AC from low to high, high to low, basically on demand. Also, AC is far easier to generate and it takes a lot less money. The other factor is with some sort of equivalent DC system providing the same amount of power, you'd need six conductors, six cables, rather than the three cables that three-phase electric AC needs. So that alone, you're talking about a lot of costs and a lot of expense and very short distances as far as being able to transport the electricity. And DC cannot be transformed or changed 
very easily. You can't raise the voltage or lower it, and you certainly can't just generate it on the spot, pump it up to 100,000 volts, send it 100 miles down the road, and then take it back down to either a 240-120 system or a 480-208 or 177 or whatever you happen to be working with, it's easy to transform AC into some other form. You could have a whole panel full of 480 three-phase breakers wherever the power comes in the plant, and you can take transformers or banks of transformers or anything else for that matter and run it off of the power coming in and transform it to 220, 110, 240, 120. You can get 208, 177. There's all different types of voltages that you can get out of just a, a standard transformer. And they don't have to be huge transformers. They're, they're not that big, but even wherever they're stored at, they're sort of out of sight, out of mind anyway. In fact, the heat given off by the transformer might give it a second calling to just be a heater. But all of those are <clears throat> different ways of looking at it, and thank goodness that Tesla did win the bid. Because not only were his inventions important, but they were real game changers as far as being able to transmit electricity for hundreds of miles at high voltages and tap into them anywhere along the way and um, do that type of thing. You know, bring them up or bring them down and find out whether or not you can just control the voltage at any particular point in time. So there are some major advantages to AC. The advantage that DC has is that it's very portable. Anything that has a battery, a phone, computer, anything like that has to start off DC. Even the drones that fly around in the sky have an initial DC system that allows you to take the DC and make it into AC and many of these drone motors, especially on the military class or the more expensive, takes the DC and turns it into a, a three-phase AC motor on a very small frame. So most of the time AC and DC are found in a lot of different systems, even on your automobile. The alternator would produce three-phase electrical, perhaps 120 volts, and it's rectified and, and reduced. It's turned back into DC and transformed down to 12 volts to charge the battery in your car, probably 14 volts, actually. So that's a big deal as far as that goes. And so there's many, many examples of DC and AC living in the same car. A lot of the electric cars, like for example, the Tesla car, they would have 4,000 one point something cell batteries. And on those batteries, they have, would have 4,000 batteries in that one car. And then from the batteries, it would go back to an inverter and change it into three-phase electric. And then you have a three-phase power motor and a lot of different things like that that are, I'm using that to illustrate the fact that AC and DC are mixed often and in many different scenarios that you may not think of. Even in your phone or transistor radio, 
anything like that is going to have AC and DC working side by side. I know I probably won't be around to see it, considering the fact that I've seen 50 years of change already, but I can hardly imagine what the next 50 years will bring. In the 60s, as when I was a kid, we used to watch a cartoon series called The Jetsons. And many people thought that the Jetsons would probably be here by now. The whole lifestyle and that sort of thing. But I don't think it's too far in the future with all the different drones and drone type vehicles. That would be the major factor. Even going back to that World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, they illustrated uh, moving sidewalks, different types of lighting, like fluorescent lighting, also the future of wireless broadcasting, like radios, television. All of that was very far into the future. Even 50 years after the light bulb was invented, probably a fourth of the people in America actually had a light bulb in their house. And in 1925, I know it was less than half the households in America, even 20, 30 some years after that World's Fair, even had a light bulb in their house. So a lot of that stuff changed very slowly, even though there was the technology there. But nevertheless, there are a lot of things that are becoming part of our ordinary lives, such as these cell phones. In the early 70s, I did some television work when I was a student at Valley College. And the camera on this phone is better than a $250,000 floor camera back in 1973 that was hundreds of times larger than this telephone. So just seeing all the different changes like that are amazing. My, I still lived at a time when operators still physically took out the wires, patched through a call at a call center, physically patching the wires through. When I was doing television work, as I mentioned before, to change the lighting or the relays and that sort of thing, we would actually have these quarter inch plugs and we'd plug this contactor or the power that was coming off of one contactor would go through this cord and this cord would pass to another contactor that was somewhere in the studio that would turn on a light. So that's how you added or, or subtracted or configured your lights that were on the set for the television. And that wasn't that long ago. But, so there was a lot of changes that I've definitely seen in my lifetime. And I just had my first granddaughter born uh, about two weeks ago. And I can't even imagine what the planet's going to look like when she's in her 60s. But I'm sure she's going to see some very interesting things and things that we probably haven't even thought of. They say a third of the people alive today will live to be over 100, which if you go back not that long ago, living to be 100 was amazing. My grandfather wanted to live to be 100, and when he got to age 97, he was afraid he was going to make it, <laughs> which, God willing, he took him at 97, and I'm sure he was happy about that. But Nevertheless, 100 years is not a long time, and certainly not 50 years. So we'll have to watch and see what happens in that length of time in the future, and probably just stand in amazement, thinking that half the stuff we thought of wasn't even possible. When I was a young man, I was very much interested in space, and Sputnik had gone around and orbited the planet, and then President Kennedy in 1960 
told the American people that we were going to go to the moon. And the person that was sitting there on the front row knew that most of the responsibility would fall on him, and he immediately realized the first thing they needed was the rocket fuel. So that's what they worked on, and that's what brought about the going to the moon and all that type of thing, which happened under Nixon, finally. And But Kennedy said by the end of the decade, and that happened in 1969. So it did happen according to Kennedy's vision. But a lot of that wouldn't have taken place except with some pretty severe challenges and visionaries. Even Walt Disney, and supposedly his father was at the 1893 World's Fair and saw this lighted city and only imagined how different his life would be. Well, Walt Disney was a big factor in my life and that going back to that carousel of progress, he was the, the visionary that saw things in the future. And after he had died, Disney in Orlando had opened up and they had Mrs. Disney there. And they asked Miss Disney, wouldn't it be great if Walt was here to see this? And she seemed incredulous and looked back at the person and said, if Walt hadn't have seen this, we wouldn't be here. So we need people like Walt Disney and John F. Kennedy and people like that to set goals and to see into the future and to imagine things as they're going to be rather than what they are now. Going back to the World's Fair in 1893, that was showing people how a city could look if it had electric lights and motors and things like that, which was not happening at that time. They were still using gas lamps and whale oil lamps and kerosene lamps and all different other types of lighting configurations, burning some sort of a flammable liquid but virtually no one had any sort of an electric light except maybe Thomas Edison in his house and maybe a very few people that had a few light bulbs running off of some batteries. So now that we have lights and computers and televisions and cell phones and transistor radios and all the rest of it, where, where do we go from here? What's the next big adventure? Is it going to be uh, AI? Is it going to all be artificial intelligence? Or is it going to be some pseudo type of thing like a virtual reality? Because virtual reality can be just as impressive as artificial intelligence. So it's things like that that this next generation are going to have to answer and to plot the course of the future, very similar to the early explorers back in the 15th and 16th century. There's still frontiers out there. In the 1960s, we watched Lost in Space, which was a far cry better than Flash Gordon or some of the earlier stuff. But when Star Trek hit the airways, everybody immediately dumped Lost in Space because Star Trek was really cool. They had the transporters, they had mock speed, they had the cool looking spacecraft, they were going to worlds beyond, and that was very enticing and very motivating for young minds to think of when is that going to happen and how is it going to happen. And will I be alive to see that? And there's probably some people that are alive in 2019, which it is now, that are going to see that. Because with a, a third of the people being expected to live to be over 100, that would put my granddaughter at 2119. Well, 2020 or 2119 
I just can't even imagine what uh, things would be like, and, and neither can most people. And I've seen a lot of changes, so I see the possibilities, but nevertheless, there's things way beyond the possibilities that we can dream up today that we won't even know about till sometime in the, in the far future. But it's always come to pass that if you can dream it, you can make it a reality. So dream big and try to realize where you, we're gonna go from here and be part of the pioneer spirit and the, the pioneer minds and motivation that makes things happen. And that's kind of my challenge to everyone and I really hope that you've learned something from a little bit of reflection over the last 50 years and that you can glean from that and to challenge yourself through that and to just be part of that change. And don't be afraid to dream. That's how the future's built, is on dreams and imagination. You have to be able to dream it, you have to be able to imagine it for it to happen. So consider all these things and Godspeed for the future. Be watching for future videos and things that you may find interesting. And I'm going to try to develop things that maybe you haven't thought about and to help motivate you to be a better thinker and a better planner and a better motivator for yourself and for others. Until then, I'll see you later.